The Bible says in Genesis 3 and 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord. Everybody say the voice of the Lord. God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The voice and the presence hand in hand amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Let's place our Bibles down and go before the Lord. Jesus, we need you. Lord, I need your help tonight to bring forth this, this, this thought tonight. To quicken the hearts and the minds of your, your people. Help us, Lord, to be available. To answer the questions that you have for us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Give someone a high five and you can be seated. Nothing will quench, listen to me, the fire of God in you faster than when you love the things of this world. Be careful the appetite and the affections that you develop. Be careful the person you become because you might be surprised how difficult you are to navigate over to get back to the presence of God. God wasn't confused about the location of Adam. God really didn't need an answer, but Adam did. Adam had already well, let me put that in. Had Adam already taken God for granted? Had Adam already gone accustomed to walking with the Lord on a daily basis that somehow this situation with Eve and the serpent had already drawn enough attention to where what God had said to him and what God had meant to him no longer had the same luster and shine that he was now willing to entertain other things had Adam already gone less than all in. Adam and Eve, being who they were, had nothing to compare their life with and unable to realize the cost of half-heartedness. The human spirit and will is what you choose with. Your human spirit is controlled by your will. We are to yield ourselves to God. This is a command. We are to yield ourselves to God. Romans 6 tells us in verses 12 and 13, let not sin therefore reign. That word sin right there is broad. Anything and everything that puts you less than next to God is a problem. Anything that comes between you is a problem. Let not sin therefore reign. Let it not get preeminence. Not, don't let anything become idolatry. Anything to gain your affection. Don't ever fall in love or love to do something so much more than you love to live for God. In your mortal body. It's talking about our bodies. I've seen amazing people who had a, a, a sincere love for God misplace their affections and love and years go by and they don't realize how far the relationship has drifted like Samson they can't stand up like at other times they can't do their life is filled with more tears than triumph that you should obey in the lust thereof it's sad how much lust we become obedient to Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. When you, when, when you come in this thing and you get born again, there has to be a change. There's got to be a transfer. I'm living for something else. I've said it before. I'll say it again. We live modestly that we may give generously. Or radically. You have to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Don't compare yourself with someone. They may not be called to what you're called to. 
Trying to be like somebody else is a waste of who you are. Romans 6 and 16 goes on and it says that I want you to, it says the word yield again. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey. That wording makes us think, of, 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 of a great house, of being servants, so you don't understand it's a great world and it's what you're serving. You can, you can actually lower your, because you're fearfully, fearfully and wonderfully made, you can lower your life to serving things. You think about that for a minute, something with no, with, with no soul, something, with no, something that would ever weep for you. You can give your whole life to it. I'm going I'm to pull this out here in just a minute. Obey, his servants, you are to, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of disobedience unto righteousness. Whatever it is you yield yourself to is what you serve. The yield in the translation where you pull out literally means to exhibit. What do you exhibit? That's what you've yielded yourself to. That's what you're about. We see people with, wait a minute, there's going to be a whole bunch of Football supporters of a team they don't support, but because there's a single game that's come down, you know, have a bunch of, and I don't even care about that. But what you yield yourself to, it's what you're about. If you see me during hunting season, I'm gonna have on a ball cap and some clothes. He's a hunter. You're not. I'm exhibiting that. If you had a business card made up in your pocket that you handed out, it will be about what you are. Mm-hmm. That word yield is, is, it is what you place next to you. It's what it means. It's what you exhibit. Now here, here I am. When you set out an exhibit, here's me and you stand by it. It's a double meaning there for those of you paying attention. It's what you recommend. It's what you present. This is me. This is what I'm about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In Romans 12, Paul speaking, he says, I beseech you therefore. I plead with you. Almost, I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God that you present. You got an exhibit. What are you presenting? Oh, is this too heavy tonight, young people? I apologize. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Listen, we'll get to something in a minute that's going to touch all you. Holy, acceptable unto God. See, that's how, how can you know what's acceptable to God if you're not walking with him? There's a lot of people going to be in trouble when they go, oh, God's okay with this. What did you? Are you close enough to ask him? Which is your reason? Reasonable. Can, can, can I say that? I, I, is that the lowest common denominator? Reasonable service? And be not, okay, now this is where I, I wanted to really, because I touched this last week. I won't touch it again tonight. And and be not conformed to this world. Let me tell you something. If you feel comfortable out there, if you, if you think you're such a much out there, or you're, you're this, or you're out there, look at me. I'm, there, there, there's, there should be something in your whole Holy Ghost. That, oh, come on. I, oh, come on. You get comfortable sliding up in a bar and tipping a couple back. Man, You've seared your conscience when you, you can be all about something instead of all about the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. You talk about being holy? Well, whatever you want to call it. You said, well, let's get that. If, if, if you're ashamed of him, you want your neighbors to know about your stuff, but not about your Savior. Look, I, I mean to get into nitty gritty because it's where we're at. You're not going to be lost because I, I won't preach it. You'll be lost because you don't want to hear it. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Guess where you win and lose this fight? That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You got to get the picture of what your presentation is. Stop and think about it, young ladies. It's your day. Not your birthday. It's your wedding day. You got a picture of this. 
There's nothing like the wedding ceremony. There's nothing that points to beautifulness more than a wedding ceremony. The decorations, the preparation, the music, all is going on. There's a crowd of people. Let me tell you something. There's only one thing that really matters, and it's the presentation of the bride. We are the bride of Christ, and there's going to be a presentation. All else, the moment she steps forth, pales. Everybody stands, and she steps forth, glistening in all white, clean, untouched, unblemished, without spot and wrinkle. That, that is how we are to be striving to present ourselves to our God daily. You can use me, Lord. I'm separating myself. I'm cleansing. I'm washing my hands of all the filthiness of the flesh because I want to be fit for the masters. You can, as a pastor, and I appreciate it, and I want you all to strive to be used. I got, trust me, there's always something to be done around here. But it's more in your hands to be fit for use than me to find out where you fit to be used. I got people banging on me, upset at me all the time. Well, I want to do this and I want to do that. Well, man, there, you, what, you don't think I'm going to put the best up? If you're consecrated, you don't miss and you're doing everything about, man, you better believe here. Put that on display. But if you show up with colloquialisms and the same old, same old, and a bad spirit and a questioning spirit, you can't get along with it. See, the bride stays ready. She makes sure she's prepared because it's not a last minute thought. She's been planning for it. She's getting ready for it. Matthew 25, it says, and while they went to buy, because some weren't ready, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut, because when you are going to present something, you get it ready. You have to ask yourself, I know you'll come into church, but this is to prepare you to be ready. And I'll say before I say, you need to be able to go to heaven from this service. If you're not full of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, you, you, you better get desperate and grab. These ain't here for show. Make sure you're ready to be presented because you ain't going to be able to run to church later. You know, if I hadn't used my will this morning, I might not have gotten out of bed. But there were things I needed to do. So my will said, get up. Look, no one's going to stand for God. I didn't know. No, you're going to get ready what you think is important. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If I hadn't submitted my spirit and will to God and his will, I, I might not be here tonight. <laughs> what? You don't think I got flesh? You don't think there's something else I could be doing? I think I got a slab leak at my house right now. I think I got a, 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 an irrigation leak. I, I, man, I got a hole to dig tomorrow. I got. But I'd rather lose there than here. I don't care if I ever get that car done. I'd rather lose there than here. I don't care if I, if I got everything perfect in my life. I'm striving to get myself ready to be presented to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because just like he asked Adam, where art thou? That's a question we better be able to ask. Where am I tonight? Where am I in God, really? Where are you in God, really? You don't want to ask that question after. <laughs> Listen to this in Hebrews 10, 25 and 26. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, I hate, forgive me, God. I dislike this verse because I'm not begging anybody to come to church. This ain't no church to snub your nose up at. Watch out. Turn around. Turn around and watch what God's doing. I don't know where a lot of people are tonight. I know we got some sick, but trust me, God's going to fill it up. He's, he'll put someone in your spot. 
He's going to have a bride. He's going to have a church. I'm all in there. I don't care about nothing else. I want to live for God. Not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is trust. There will be some people that it ain't no big deal. If you want to buy into that and start half-stepping, if you don't think being full of the Holy Ghost, being baptized in Jesus' name and living right back, go ahead. And so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin, it's the next verse. Willfully. You can't sit there knowing you're not right with God and not do something. That's willful. The, the struggle is not the problem. It's when you stop that it is. When you stop coming to an altar, when you stop apologizing, when you stop saying, God, I'm going to keep fighting that problem. And remember, the, the struggle's in your mind. Change your mind. Be not conformed. Be ready for anybody ready for transformation. You know, transformation, transformation. I'm going all in. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. And that just it. Because guess what? What's the first thing you say when you're in trouble with your mama? I don't know. I I didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to eat that. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to go there. I, I don't know. Ain't going to work. I don't know, I ain't gonna fly. You've been given the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There's something about asking good questions. And if you're on the ministerial staff, I'll tell you right now, now I get frustrated if you bring a silly question. Y'all know that. This is not the time, this is for hard questions. I want hard questions. I want one. If you can ask, don't you come to me with that. that uh, you know what you need. Uh-uh. You better come to me when you sit there and go, oh, man. Because anybody can answer the easy ones. Right. We got to be able to answer the hard ones. We got to be able to take on the difficult ones. There was a rabbi who was asked one time, and uh, he said, you know, we'll let me back up. We'll talk about a scientist first. And a scientist was asked, who was also a Nobel Prize winner. He asked about uh, retelling a story of his childhood. And he said that every day after school, his mother would ask him every day, what questions did you ask today? She never wanted to know what he'd learned. She only ever inquired, did you ask a good question today? The scientist goes on and says, Asking good questions made me become a scientist. Because asking good questions is sometimes more important than giving answers. Which is a strange thought for us today because everyone, we, we, we want to think that we have the solution. We are obsessed with knowing and solving all problems. Hey, the, you want to know why it's get upset with husbands? Because they're always trying to say to solve the answer instead of listening to the emotional outcry. And all the married folks said amen. Mm-hmm. But bear with me for a second. In Scripture, we see that even God understood the value of a good, probing question. Countless times in your Bible, God asked questions. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. But he asked questions that not only changed the course of a person's life, but also... They powerfully echo, if you'll look at them, into our lives today at this present moment. These questions serve to challenge every one of us. If Where art thou? Because your answer reveals you. Your will is found in your answer. Where art thou? Jesus asked the question in John 21. He said, so when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me will and knees? Jesus is asking questions. I'm not all wet here. Y'all need to listen. Hey, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said, then to feed my lambs. He, he, he said unto him again a second, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said to him, hey, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. 
he said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest of me. Three questions, ten questions in a row. When God asks questions, we probably want to take notice. Peter was grieved. How many of you get upset even at this little message tonight, this little, this little sack lunch mess? Because he said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. If you know he knows all things, you think the question might want to make you think about the fact that he knows all things and he's asking you. If he knows, maybe he wants you to know. God has made your will a powerful thing. You look at it as a right, and I get that, but you need to understand how powerful it is. You want to know how powerful your will is? It's God's will that none should perish. But your will can override that. Your pride can override that. Even though God wants you to go to heaven, he has given you the ability to cho choose to turn away and go to hell. You, that's how powerful that bad boy is. You could sit there, look all cute, and look all holy, but on the inside, there's a rotten will. Ugh! So much more powerful than the will of God. And he lets you have it. God won't put anybody in hell. He's just going to grant people's requests. Yes. Do you want to go to heaven? It seems like a silly question. But God has given you the choice. You determine where you're going to spend eternity. There'll be no, I don't know, or I didn't feel, I didn't that. No, him that knows the good, to do good, do it the not. To him and the sin and the way sin is. And that's your will. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, the entire world. But he made it clear that few will make it. Because very few will choose to make it their will to make it. It's your choice. It's your choice. Jesus said the road to heaven is straight and narrow. Few there be that find it. You know what he didn't say? It's not hidden. It's not obscure. It's not confusing. In fact, it's in plain sight. It's our will that gets in the way. It's our will that can, there'll be no tears of sympathy that'll get you. Come on, come on, we, we know. I got a dog at the house that tries to use sympathy to get his way. So let me tell you something. You have emotions no higher than the level of a dog if you think you're going to shed tears and show a sad face to get out of what God's asked you to do. While the road to hell is broad, it's wide, it's easy, it's filled with whatever you want, it's filled with whatever you please. There's no rails, there's no rules, there's no rewards. It's filled with people. And they're on it for two reasons. One, they reject Christ and his gift of eternal life. And two, they just simply did nothing about it. That being said, and as painfully true as it is, God has not abandoned humanity. I'm thankful today he has given us his awesome word. He's given us his love. He's given us his will. He's given us his spirit. I'm thankful today. He's handed us preachers and teachers and evangelists. He made a way of escape if you choose it. It's not all doom and gloom if you'll say, hey, I don't want to perish, God. I want to go all in. I don't want nothing to hinder me. I don't even want to allow something around that makes me think I might miss out. God has always spoken and drawn humanity close to himself. The plan of salvation in Acts 2.38 is there for all to read, for all to obey. God is always there for whosoever will. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord hath appeared unto 
of old unto me, saying, Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. No one will miss out because of the love of God. People will miss out because they have, don't have a love for God. God's still moving among us right now. He's here. And I believe I can hand this pulpit over to a number of you. And the will of God would be preached and taught because you would move under the unction. He still, his spirit still moves. His word still works. Because his will is still, none would perish. The Bible tells us in Acts 17 that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after. When's the last time you felt after God? When's the last time you laid down your pride in yourself and said, God, not my will, but thy will be done. If Jesus could find himself on his face in the garden and, and, and sweating great drops of blood for, for, for us to make it, can any of us? He goes on and says, and I find him, though he be not far from any one of us. He's right there. I've said it for years. He's as close as the mention of his name, and he still is tonight. For in him we live. You're alive today because of the will of God. You're alive today because of prayer. You can't say he's far or I can't feel. It's not about far and feel. It's about obedience. It's about saying, not my will, but thy will be done. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. For as much then as were we are his offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art of men's device. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is a door. Repentance is a gift. Some of you are still together in relationships because of the ability to say you're sorry and repent and go the other way. Repentance merely saying, I've been going this way too long. I haven't felt God. The Holy Ghost haven't moved on me. I, I can't spoke in tongues in tongues and months. I, I haven't been right in my spirit. Repentance is merely, I'm going to turn around and head back to God. I want to get closer to him. God still speaks yesterday and today. Genesis 8 and 15, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Genesis 16 and 13, and she, Hagar, called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. Thou, God, seest me. God not only hears you, speaks to you, but he sees you. For she said, I have also here looked after him that seeth me. Exodus 6 and 2, and God spake unto Moses, and it said unto him, I am the Lord. Second Peter one twenty one for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God is still speaking. Hebrews 1 and 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That sundry means by many portions, by many times, and in many ways. Exodus 3 and 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, oh, when God sees you turn to get close, when God sees you make that effort, when God watches you decide, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Here it. Come on. Acts chapter 9, Paul on the road to Damascus is asked the question. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. One of the most notable exchanges is in 1 Kings. He came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Where are you, Adam? What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? There's a whole, there's a whole bunch, but it's a Wednesday night. I couldn't give you them all. 
And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, am only left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. Notice there's a conversation going on here. Behold, the Lord passed by in great and strong wind, rent the mountains and breaking pieces of rocks before the Lord. It was all God. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. It's God. The Lord was not in the earthquake. Some of you are so distracted by the wind and the earthquake and all the clamor of the world that you're missing the Lord. And after the earthquake of fire, it's God that did that, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Come full circle, folks. You're going to find where you left God when you get right back to where you should have been. The same question will be asked. And behold, there came a voice in him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? The same question. No matter how much storm, wind, fire, earthquakes, God did not change the question. Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? Numerous ways God speaks to people. Various ways. Today we have the wonderful parables of Jesus that continue to echo his voice. We have the prodding unction and the oppression of his spirit. We have his unchanging word, Malachi 3 and 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. The unchanging God will speak to those who will listen. I still believe God is speaking. The question is, can you hear? 1 Corinthians 14, 21, and the law is written with men and other tongues, with other lips, will I speak unto this people? And yet, for all that will they, for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. The word must be read. The spirit must be heeded. And his voice must be heard. And for the first person who comes up here to me, I have a $5 bill. spoke softly, closest, and he heard me. The reason some of you are not receiving what you want or what he's saying is you're too far away. Now the Bible says he's not far from any one of us, so what's the deal? What's in the way? Your will. You are. You are in the way of your own salvation. Hey, I, I, you know what? The saddest part about me being the pastor here is I don't act like I'm such a much. I ain't nothing special. I got to walk in the same flesh and blood like you do. I fight the same battles. See, I've come from an era where every preacher, in fact, Brother uh, Harvey preached, touched on it this past weekend. I, I come, I, you had that? But that was your era. You had that like everything was good and everything was fine and bless God, I'm fine. Oh, wait a minute. Every, Brother Wizard, everything's fantastic. A lion right here in the house of God. Car didn't start. You and your wife are bickering. The bills ain't paid. Cat died. Well, it's okay if the cat died. Dog not feeling good. Oh, it's fantastic. You lying. Walk around like, oh, I don't need God. Some of you got in a place, you're so comfortable with where you're at without God that you can't be the will of God. Some of you created your own dilemma. You're so big that you're too much to climb over to get to God. See, that pride made a mountain. Mm -hmm. 
It's hard to hear God when you're so loud. It's hard to hear the will of God when your voice echoes of opinions, colloquialisms, and ideas that feel good to your flesh. And sadly, some of us have led our own families astray because our opinions are so large. Our spirits are even so big that the Spirit of God is like, I can't strive with you. When you're ready for me to be the Lord of your home, I'll come back. But right now, it's up to us to be close enough to hear that still small voice. It's up to us to be close enough. Not my will, but thy will be done. Are you close enough to your voice tonight? Are, can I ask this? Are you, are you still pursuing God and faithful enough to even read his word that he may speak to you through his word? Are you even able and spiritual enough to be able to rightly divide the word? See, let me tell you, fall, living for God is easy. The problem is, is we get in the way, we make it so difficult. We make it so complicated. You other, other ministers in here, you know full well, sometimes you're just in the office dealing with something. They have complicated it so much with this and that, and so much feelings get involved. I'm like, and you tell them to repent? Wait a minute, you're not telling me to repent. It don't make me feel very good. Listen, that's, I'm not the one that didn't make you feel good. Your will is making you feel bad. Your pride, your, 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 your opinion, your, your, your ideology, your, your, your subculture and this bigness that you've made yourself and your culture and your persona has gotten bigger than Jesus. Let me ask this question. Are you spiritual enough to be ushered in by the presence of God? Are you spiritual enough that if you're off on a tangent, the sweet spirit of God can say, hey, anybody here know what I mean by that? God, just, you, you, you just, man, I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I've been, boy, I've been ready to, do, and God just. Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Because how can that happen without it? He says, with a stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. When's the last time? Isaiah 28 and 11, Romans 8 and 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Quit feigning so much strength. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep. When's the last time you found that place with God, where the Spirit of God could moan and groan through you as you yielded yourself? Paul said, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit, God calleth Jesus accursed. You're sideways with the church. You're sideways with God. You're si half the stuff in there. I've even seen men of God put wave their hand. I've, right, I've watched a man of God hold a Bible. I don't even know if I believe all this. That's someone who got too big. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you something. You need to repent and yield. Oh, no, I know we don't like to hear that. You want a magic pill? You want to spin around three times, throw a dollar over your head? Or you want, oh, Pastor, hand me 200 bucks. I'll do something. To, uh, just let me sing. I mean, I just, uh, no. Real victory is on the other side of being led of the Holy Ghost. Because you either going to be full of the Holy Ghost or you're going to be an uttermost saint. You're going to be dancing on the frail. Oh, you got the right jacket. You got the right dress, the right hair, like the right sleeve. Like, oh, that's right. But inside it's dead. You're on the fringe. You're on the outside. You're lukewarm, distant, and distracted if you weren't here. 
last week to hear what lukewarm means. I apologize. Go find it on the internet. You question God rather than your condition. You question his word rather than your carnality. You question his spirit instead of your own. You see, the question is, can I still do all this and go to heaven? That's the wrong way. There should be, am I pleasing to God? Remember the bride. Everybody stands. She steps forth without spot and wrinkle. Am I pleasing to God today? Can you hear me, Lord? Seven times in the book of Revelation, it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. God still asking question, where art thou? What doest thou here? We're inundated with voices today. We get arrogant and prideful. We make statements like, and I, I read something the other day, I was completely appalled. And I'll paraphrase that. Who cares if I don't get up and I want to spend 14 hours on Facebook and, and then put on the 50s, 60s, and 70s music and wear a bikini and, and walk half naked down a beach? That didn't come from the Holy Ghost. And yet I'm the bad guy for bringing it up. Oh, woe is me if I preach not. Can you hear with all the voices you've allowed to be a man slapping you on the back because you got this or got that or other people that you like, you look good, girl, all that stuff. You, you're living for the endorphin of a pat or a like instead of being pleasing to God. We've got music and news media, social media, opinions, ideas, philosophy, cycle, babble, and false teaching, and we're surrounded. So it's a, port, it's a pertinent question. I don't want to wait to you ask yourself this question. He speaks in various ways through the Bible, through his anointed vessels, and even through the heavens which declare his glory and speaks of his handiwork in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. He speaks. Still small voice. And he still speaks. The form of a question. Just like he did with Elijah. Just like he did with Adam. When we ask questions, it's with the intention of obtaining information. When, all, when God asks questions, however, it's not to inform him of something he already knows. What doest thou here, Elijah? Where art thou, Adam? God knew. But it was the listeners that needed help. So God asks questions to help us because he cares. From the onset of the story of man, when he sinned, when he fell, though God already knew what had happened, he would come up to an Adam and say, where are you? The Gospels record over 300 questions that Jesus asked. Questions he already had the answers to. But Jesus has only asked 183 questions. Listen. You have a free choice. We all do. That's to the glory of God. He doesn't want robots. He wants relationship. If you don't, that's okay. Sit there. Look, my wife and I are fighting, but it's quiet in my house. She's in where she is, and I'm where I'm at. No, no, no communication going. What are you doing? Yeah, we, I, I'm sorry. I know you don't think. Yeah, we get tiffs now and then. Layla, we do. She's awesome and all that. She's amazing. But we still have our spirits and our wills that get in the way. And sometimes those same spirits and wills get in the way with us and God right here. The thing is, we have free choice. The problem is we don't have 
freedom from consequences. In fact, another question is asked in the Bible, and you find it in Genesis 4. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you wroth? It's very interesting when this question is asked. And why is thy countenance fallen? Two questions, followed by a statement. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Abel will be fulfilling your desires. And you should rule over him. That's what the next line is. And then it says, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. See, he just got through talking to God and went and killed his brother. You can come in here and have a great service and walk right on out of here and gossip and kill everything God just did. Personal attack and assassinate the pastor, assassinate the preacher, assassinate the Sunday school teacher, assassinate the youth leader, and not realize Could it be in God's benevolence that he asks questions not only because he is gentle in his approach to us, but so that we can exercise that free will and not be coerced, intimidated, or manipulated into choosing God? You see, in a moment, I'm going to have us all stand. I will not come out there and force any one of you to come and pray through. It will not be that way here. And I don't know how many altar calls I've given. And I don't know how many you've heard. But every one of us is responsible for our response. Response. Remember the old saying, your, your greatest ability is your response ability. How is your response to God? Cute, don't go nowhere with God. T and Layla, y'all awesome, y'all cute as buttons. That's not how you get to heaven. Sister Wizard, I hope it's Wizard, because I don't want to call you the wrong name. And I'm sure you and Sister Davenport are the sweetest ladies on the planet. But if you don't respond to God, you're no better off than these little sweethearts over here. You don't get in, but you'll get grandfathered in, and you don't get in with cuteness. Repentance is beautiful. Hearing the voice of God is, is oh, Jesus, let me hear you. We're, we're, we're so enamored that we want God to do so that we don't realize that if we would respond, he would move. God was right there handing Cain the choice. His questions are more like invitations to us to personally consider our lives in relationship to him. His love invites and asks questions. It's his love that responds. I don't know about you. But my parents raised me with a statement that checked my attitude. Now, unlike most of you, I pretty much got reprimanded on the day. I was one of them idiot kids. I, I got it late in life from lighting things on fire and breaking things, wrecking my dad's track. I, you know what? With all that, sometimes comes a smart mouth. Now, I know none of y'all know nothing about that. You ever heard the statement from that? Now, don't answer a question with a question. <laughs> I am convinced, however, <laughs> that so often the answer to the questions we have in our lives are found in the questions that God asks us. <laughs> 
Jesus asked his disciples, as I bring this to a close, but who do you say that I am? They had to answer the question for themselves and the outcome for them and tonight as well as us will determine the trajectory of your faith. Who do you say that he is? You, by yourself, on your own, when you stand before God, as he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And you have to answer. Your life is your answer. I am convinced that God is speaking to each and every one of us every day. Who do you say that I am? I understand the where art thou? What doest thou here? Why is your countenance fallen? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Or in Galatians, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Or what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Mark asked two questions, Jesus said. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's a question you better answer. Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Let's all stand. Our biblical brother Thomas got quite a bad rap over the years. Downton Thomas, you know, one moment, one moment. How do we know that he didn't turn into shouting Thomas? You could be Downton Thomas tonight, but you can be shouting Thomas if you want to be. Amen. It's pretty sad that he gets labeled for one moment. To be stuck with a moniker. But you know, Thomas didn't go out like that. He finally gave an answer. An answer better than I heard any of the others do. My Lord and my God, I wonder who you say that he is today. Who is Jesus to you? A footnote in your grand life? A lucky charm? Something you do to pass the time on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday? God still asks the question. You may not be able to answer it tonight, though I invite you to come and answer. I invite you tonight to gather around with me. Who do you say that he is?